booth turning up today. Just a little bit about yourself, what you do, and a little bit about Tool. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a second time entrepreneur, uh, but also with a heavy corporate uh, background from the maritime industry. I'm former global project manager from uh, the Wilhelmsen Group, and I used to be director of North Shipping. Um, and I also led the um, uh, European Green Capital Business Program for the city of Oslo uh, for 2019. Um, and now I am uh, building a startup for startups based in Oslo, but working with uh, partners from uh, across 20 countries per now. Uh, so the Ocean Opportunity Lab that I started one and a half year ago, it is an ecosystem and a community for strengthening uh, and help growing and nurturing um, uh, environmental and sustainability oriented startups within the ocean and renewable energy industries. Uh, and uh, this spring we're launching a sort of a Tinder, a tool spawn for matchmaking ocean entrepreneurs uh, with resources that they need in the various stages uh, to succeed. So that's kind of our story. Uh, and we are super happy to have the Ocean Startup Project as one of the collaboration partners. So very honored to be here. And I really look forward to our discussions today. I love, uh, I love the concept of Tinder for oceans. So there we go. All right, that is great. Uh, thanks so much, Birgit. Uh, all right, folks, thanks thanks once again for joining us. Um, the Ocean Solutions Exchange is really designed to bring together world-renowned experts to talk about ocean sectors and the opportunities that exist for startup companies. So what you're going to hear is that there is unlimited potential and growth in the ocean sector, and that you are as well positioned as anyone to take advantage of it. My hope is that you walk away from today having listened to the speakers and consider where your ideas, your passion, and your expertise fit with all of the opportunities presented by them. What I know for sure is that there is funding and resources available for good ideas here in Canada, and we at the Ocean Startup Project want to help you get there. So I'm just going to give you a little slide presentation, folks, before we get to the much more interesting part of uh, speaking with our speakers here. So the Ocean Startup Project is a, it's a pan-Atlantic collaboration here in Canada between Creative Destruction Lab, Genesis Center out of Newfoundland, Innovacore in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick Innovation Foundation, uh, PEI BioAlliance, Springboard Atlantic, and Creative Destruction Lab. And they have come together in partnership with uh, the Ocean Supercluster and ACOA to launch the Ocean Startup Project. So really our vision, folks, is to make Canada the best place in the world to grow and start an ocean company. And a year ago, I would have said, that's a really big, bold vision. You have countries like where Birgit is from in Norway, uh, you have the United States, a lot of countries doing oceans really well. We think in Canada, with all the focus that is being placed on the ocean right now, being the best uh, place to start and grow an ocean company could become a reality. So you have our project, you've got what the Ocean Supercluster is doing, and all of the funding announcements and collaborations it's creating. We've got infrastructure here in Canada, like Cove, we've got Holyrood out of Newfoundland, we've got the PEI BioAlliance, and then we have a new initiative in Victoria called the Ocean Futures Innovation Hub, which is now going to be changed to, I think, Coast. So there's just so much happening here in Canada around the ocean sector. So this slide is really why we are so bullish on Canada's strength and opportunity in the ocean sector. On this slide, there are world-renowned companies intertwined with some incredibly impressive startups that are primed for success and are going to make a big difference in the ocean sector. There are so many more companies that are making an impact, and these are just some of the ones that you're going to hear about. On this slide, you've got some of our cohort, our first ocean startup project cohort. You have Qualities doing really interesting stuff on corrosion. You have a company like Kavacha who is doing uh, stuff with paint for ships, Blue Lion Labs, Seahawk Robotics. These are companies that you're gonna hear much more about as, as we move through the, the next few years in the ocean sector. 
So what's next for the Ocean Startup Project? This year, we have $1.4 million that we're gonna be awarding to new companies and new ideas that contribute, contribute to a sustainable blue economy. So look for our applications to open at the end of March in 2020. So as part of, if you are successful with your application and if you get funding from us, you're gonna get access to mentorship from globally relevant advisors. And we're gonna have three streams. We're gonna have an idea stream, which is the earliest stage, just that, that fresh idea that could blossom into a really great company. We're gonna have a growth sector for still early stage companies, but have a little bit more of a solid foundation under them. And then we're gonna have one stream, which is just that big ocean shot, that moonshot, that great big idea that if you solved it, it would, uh, it would change the dynamic in the ocean sector completely. And then we have our lab to market and CDL uh, cohorts having their second cohort going in 2021. So folks, uh, next Ocean Solutions Exchange is on February 9th. Uh, we're gonna be doing fisheries and aquaculture. And these are four of the people that we're gonna have presenting. These are again, like today, world renowned experts in, uh, in the fishing and fisheries and aquaculture sector. So please put that in your calendar. So we really wanna just stay connected with you folks. Again, February 9th, we have our fisheries and aquaculture ocean solutions exchange. And then if you need any assistance, please get in touch with uh, Katie Leard. Uh, and then follow us on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook. Uh, we'd love to stay connected with you. So I'm just gonna stop sharing this screen now. And so folks, the shipping and marine transportation sector has a long history of being one of the more dependable methods of transport, transporting goods around the globe. So today we brought together industry experts to discuss challenges, trends and opportunities they see in the industry. So at the end of this, there's going to be a networking portion of today's event, and you'll have the opportunity to connect directly with speakers, with the speakers and others who are interested in learning about shipping and marine transportation. The event is hosted on Zoom and is being live streamed out to the Tool Aquarium, an interactive event platform that the Ocean Opportunity Lab has so graciously allowed us to use today. Uh, so after the discussion, we'll open up those breakout rooms and we'll give you more instructions at that time. So if you're tuning in from the aquarium, please note that you won't be able to join the breakout uh, rooms, but there will be an opportunity for you to connect with others on the platforms. So Birgit, thank you again for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce the speakers. You're good. If you're there, you may be on mute. Oh, maybe we've lost the, maybe we've lost period. Um, so why don't I just take over? So um, Edward, Edward Schwartz is with ABB. Edward, maybe you could give us your title and sure. uh, talk a little bit about what you're doing at ABB and what ABB is doing generally. Absolutely. Thank you, Donald. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And, and thank you for the, the work that Ocean Startup is doing. It's, uh, it's very encouraging. So a little bit about myself and ABB. Um, oh, I think we got beer good back. I don't know if you want me to pause and just continue. Uh... Okay. <laughs> no problem. No problem. I'll, I'll continue. So um, I work for ABB. Um, ABB is a, uh, a leading um, digital technology uh, leader in, in the market. Um, we're in all sorts of, of markets in the industry. Um, I work specifically for our marine and ports group. Um, within marine and ports, I'm responsible for our sales and execution team in the Americas, so North and South America, responsible for new sales projects. So developing those new projects and then seeing them through, through commissioning. Uh, we do a lot of hybridization projects, a lot of zero emission, low emission projects that we're working on right now, um, and kind of developing those technologies as to where we see the trends going in, in the transportation industry. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a marine engineer by, by trade. I was a chief engineer sailing on ships for, for about 10 years, uh, then got into the propulsion side of the market, worked for a couple European propulsion companies, um, and now have found myself at ABB where um, I enjoy it very much. We're, we're kind of a an entrepreneurial group within a very large company. So it's a, it's a very nice place to be. Um, and we like finding new kind of challenging projects in the market is, is really where we find ourselves 
uh, best suited. Um, we're in definitely big advocates of, of a sustainable transportation industry in total. Uh, we see the marine industry as really kind of on the on the driving side of, of adopting these new technologies. Um, we see it's, uh, it has great potential and uh, yeah, we definitely support support blue economies um, all around the world. There's these, these great clusters that are starting. Um, there it's, it's definitely the maritime industry is definitely a global industry, but it's, it's really driven by a lot of these local groups. So, so we're, we're big supporters of them and, uh, and appreciate it. So, and I'm, I'm ready to answer any questions or, or support anyone as, as best I can. Excellent. And um, I'm really looking forward to dive into interesting discussions uh, with you, Edward. Then we also have Elizabeth Charmley, uh, co-chair from Vancouver Maritime Center for Climate and Low Carbon Shipping Center of Excellence. And welcome, Elizabeth. Do you want to also share some, some background details from your side and also some of your kind of key passions uh, working in the industry? For sure, yes. In my time zone here in Vancouver, I'll say uh, good morning to everybody who's joined us here. It's wonderful uh, to be here speaking with you this morning. My pleasure. Um, so yeah, I'm a naval architect. I'm based out of Vancouver, British Columbia. It's my hometown. And um, I have a background, as most naval architects do, working at the beginning of my career in ship design. Um, but over the years, I got into uh, construction, ship repair, um, and then eventually working for a ship owner operator. So I currently do work for the world's largest container ship manager. Um, they run an operating fleet of about 112 container ships. And this has led to some very interesting challenges there. Um, I work in the projects and technology department where the project side of things is handling new builds and the technology side is technical support for our day-to-day -day operations at the fleet. I've also been responsible for three major technology upgrades there to help the ships run and operate more energy efficiently. And so this means things like, you know, bulbous bow, propeller refits, um, looking at operational changes in terms of draft trim optimization, and other things we can do to the ships to help them reduce their fuel consumption, which of course mean directly correlated to reduction of emissions. Um, but I'm also incredibly passionate about industry involvement. And because I have quite a lot of experience on the practical repair and operational side of things, um, I do a lot of work in the industry and uh, several years ago I was approached by um, my co-founder at the Vancouver Maritime Centre for Climate, Brian Buggy. He works for the Vancouver Economic Commission and we were looking at a way to how to address reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the maritime and shipping sector. So this brought us together and we formed a not-for-profit organization, uh, VMCC, the Vancouver Maritime Centre for Climate. We're a grassroots industry-led organization. We're currently um, in our kind of concluding our first year of operation. We're in a, still in startup mode right now, gathering members and doing what we can. And our primary mandate is to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the uh, greater Vancouver, but primarily Southwestern British Columbia. But we are in touch with many members more into the interior of British Columbia. So we're looking to include all of British Columbia as part of our mandate. And that's been a really interesting um, challenge. And we think of ourselves more of a technology accelerator hub. Um, and this has of course been a direct application of my passion of working on ships and ships operations there. So, yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. And then we have uh, Andrew McKeeran. Uh, who's a business director for Maritime Performance Services at Lloyd's Register. And we'd love to hear a little bit also about your background and, and your passions. Well, f thank you very much indeed. And firstly, thank you for, for inviting me to this event. Uh, so I'm going to say good evening um, because I'm basically based in Paris in France, but uh, obviously the accent sort of uh, takes me back to my heritage within the UK. Um, so I work for, for Lloyd's Register as the business director for our Maritime Performance Services. Uh, I'm sure people know Lloyd's Register as a trusted advisor for safe, sustainable and, and efficient shipping through our classification, certification, verification and consultancy and advisory services. Um, I, I think from, from my side of things, the real passion around these type of events is, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we have in shipping, which is the 
uh, I'm going to say cost-effective, safe transition towards decarbonisation. Um, so some of the guidelines that are obviously being laid down by the International Maritime Organisation for 2030 and 2050. This is all about partnerships of large companies and small companies to, to I'm going to say, solve the challenges that we have as an industry uh, ahead of us. Um, there's a number of things that, that obviously clearly we're doing as an organisation around our decarbonisation hub. And I think what the industry is, is rapidly realizing is the importance of digitalization as part of the decarbonization journey of unlocking the inefficiency within the overall landscape of maritime. And also it broadens it out from just the ship right the way through the entire well to wake type equation. So we can solve problems within maritime that don't solve the problem for the overall, uh, let's say, goals of the Paris, Paris initiative that we've, we've signed up to. So I think, you know, with the small startup companies, there's a lot of ideas that are coming through from all pockets around the world that will help us solve some of those large challenges. But we have to take the first steps on the transition towards the uh, let's say, sort of transformation that the industry needs to go through. So it's a big passion of mine and one that I'm happy to share with everybody on here and, and get everybody excited and involved. Excellent. And I really think we have a great and very diverse group of people here to discuss this. And, and, and picking up on your uh, final remark there, I mean, it, it has been a really strange last 12 months. Uh, and of course, we've all been thrown into... Uh, a whole different worlds. Uh, we see now the way that we're collaborating and working much more virtual that we, than we would ever have foreseen a year ago. Uh, our seafarers have been struggling and now finally the, uh, uh, the seafarer rights uh, are really uh, taken seriously with a broad alliance uh, of shipping companies. Um, and um, I would like to hear from you before moving into the innovation part of this really, can you, can you talk to me a little bit about the impacts of COVID on the shipping and transportation industry and what you think might change because of the pandemic? And then just picking back up with you, Andy, first, and then passing over the word to Elizabeth um, and, uh, and then Edward. Absolutely. So I think for, from our side of things, let, let, let's be clear, the pandemic has caused an unforeseen and dramatic impact on global trade. It's created a, a totally new way of working for people and businesses uh, and presenting high levels of both opportunity and threat for everybody across the industry. You know, if we if we set some of the, the basic figures, it's both the marine and offshore markets continue to echo that global economic trend um, due to the ongoing impacts of the pandemic. So we've seen global GDP drop by 4% last year. We've seen seaborne cargo growth drop by about 6%. And MSI, one of the forecasters within the marine industry, is sort of not forecasting a, a new construction recovery to the 2018 levels, probably till about 2025. So we've seen new construction ordering probably at about a 50% year-on-year drop. That's, that's you know, been a combination of a number of things, I would say. So certainly around the oil price, um, you know, the oil price clearly has an impact on that. That collapsed to its lowest levels last year in 18 years um, due to the massive unan unanticipated fall in global demand. Um, clearly, we've seen some new technology, let's say pushes and remote services, technology innovation as a result of the fact that we've had that decline in human movement has forced us towards that. And I think there's the, the adage now, what's caused the, uh, the digital revolution in maritime? And it's not the CIO of any organization. It's actually COVID that, that sort of forced that debate. Um, regulation is coming fast and furious. Um, so clearly we're seeing things, as we say, like the IMO 2030, 2050 aspirations, but also things like EEXI now being driven into the maritime industry. So existing ships and some of the emissions portfolio reporting, which will have a huge impact on shipping, but an opportunity around data, you know, data uh, visibility and transparency. And also what do we do with that in terms of some of the technology advances that we can make? And then I think to your point, we've got to answer the question about seafarer uh, welfare. You know, we had 300,000 seafarers stranded uh, and are still in that position now. That is a situation that's probably not going to let off in 2021. Um, so it's, it's a, a, a very serious issue at the, fun, at the forefront, I would say, of, of all senior executives within Maritime as to how do we collaboratively work to improve that situation. 
And because what we've seen this year is really how much the world depends on shipping and the maritime industry and how our industry is really, truly the blood veins of global trade and economy. And, and what would happen if the seafarers uh, simply uh, declined to get on board the ships onwards? That would be disastrous, I think, for, for all. Um, uh, what would you add, Elizabeth, uh, on top of what Andy now uh, pointed to? No, I think Andy gave a very good summary there. It's hard to add anything to that, but I would just say that um, in sort of my switch of my work working with BMCC as opposed to focusing on the ship operations side, you know, I think really the pandemic has highlighted how important shipping and transportation is, and it has given it a visibility um, around the world and in the news and in the media that it really hasn't had before. Like my experience working for a ship operator is that um, people don't really know what I do. I even tell them multiple times, explain to them, you know, people don't know where their services and goods are coming from. And with the issues with the seafarers and just reliance people at home, now online ordering, you know, has increased. Um, all these things are happening. It's put a more focus on what shipping and maritime really is. It's brought it to the forefront. And that's really enabled a chance for more networking, collaboration, communication, and ideas that can help us meet these environmental requirements. I feel like even, you know, in 2019, people were talking about um, options to green up their ships or blue up their ships, actually, maybe I should say, um, as if it were a menu option. But in 2020, where we're now, like even now, we're meeting with Zoom around the world, many different time zones before we had to fly to conferences to talk to one another. But now there's this unprecedented change in how we're communicating and collaborating with one another. And I think it's really helped to accelerate and change um, the idea about how we can have solutions and collaborate together and apply that to the maritime and shipping industry so in from my perspective and where I've been working that's really gotten a lot quicker and faster this year and brought been brought to the forefront of what we're doing hmm. and uh, and Edward I mean <laughs> there's so many changes that we're facing and are we finally now actually reaching this burning platform moment where our industry is truly ready for changing uh, across these different uh, areas and kind of perhaps moving towards the building back better uh, approach. I believe so. So, I, and it's tough to follow uh, Andrew and Elizabeth on on the current current condition because I think they have it perfectly uh, expressed where we're at. But I think also putting a pause button um, has helped us a little bit because if we're in a constant build cycle or in this constant um, you know meeting the cruise industry is meeting the next you know. Uh, new build cycle and everybody's in that side, they're, they're less time to look at, at other opportunities. And everyone always says they have the best intentions to do them, but you know, the economics drive most of the decision making. Now that, that people are stopping and pausing and, and looking at things, I think it's forced also uh, most people, but the industry too, to kind of um, think outside the box of the future. It's not, we can't just say the, the future is going to be like, just like the past. I mean, we've all agreed that things have changed um, and the industry has kind of opened up to that too. So we, we're having a lot of conversations with owners uh, of vessel owners or investment firms now that I don't think we would have had two years ago. And we weren't having two years ago because they weren't really open uh, to, to new technologies or to, to disrupting the way that they think about things. Um, we also see one of the other impacts, um, I think, of the COVID is seeing the economic input, like Elizabeth said, is now we see government regulation also, I think, taking a, a bigger stance. Um, we we kind of saw, you know, it was kind of a self-governed group for, for the most part, but now we see uh, a stronger hand coming in and saying we can give a, a lot of thanks to Norway, um, I think, for for kind of driving, it can be successfully done. You know, we, the, the regulation can come in from the government with, with subsidies, um, and figure out a way to kind of push the industry in a new direction without being too disruptive uh, in a bad way. So I think that's kind of happening. And then we see other markets like the utility companies starting to look towards the maritime industry, which they weren't looking to before as, as developing their business. So we really kind of see a diversity of, of government coming in. We see a diversity of other, other players that could be part of the industry coming in and having conversations. And then to follow up on the, the remoteness, um, ABB has always kind of been a global company. We've always kind of supported remote uh, people, but we're seeing that in other sides of the industry too. So we're bringing this remoteness is also bringing a lot of diversity. So we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of diversity in hiring, diversity in development, 
um, within a lot of historic uh, organizations in the maritime, which we feel will bring change. Um, it's not just hiring of the same, you know, people from the industry all the time. Now we see companies are being very much more open uh, in looking at CVs from around the world or looking at people of different qualifications uh, to join their organizations, which is a great thing. And I think that's probably going to have one of the one of the biggest drivers of change to the industry is just bringing in uh, new ideas and, and people with the different backgrounds. And, and this is quite interesting because I remember way back in towards 2017 when I was heading up North Shipping, uh, we really started looking at the cargo owners and the tech industry as drivers for transformation and innovation. And, and I mean, now we are really in, in the spotlight for better and worse mm -hmm. uh, because we see, um, we see a huge impact of asset managers like BlackRock, uh, Norwegian Oil Fund, et cetera, that are placing a focus on sustainability and climate change in their portfolios. Yep. And we have the Poseidon principles from some of the larger banks. And we also see, I think this year now, moving into a new taxonomy regime from the European Union. Uh, we are getting quite clear signals from Biden when it comes to the green shift and acceleration in rebuilding the American economy. Um, what do you think might really drive this transformational change uh, in the marine and transportation sector uh, so that we can really in a good way now uh, slow or halt some of the climate issues that we face while still also building really good, robust and innovative models for the future? And uh, I'll, I'll pick you back up again. Uh, and, okay. <laughs> and, uh, then Elizabeth and Andy. Okay, I'll go first this time. So, um, so I guess I'll just hit on one area of that, so that I could leave uh, leave the rest of the panel to discuss some of the other ones, and I'll just talk about investments to follow up on what you're saying. Um, yes, we see, say, the oil and gas price dropping, and uh, and we see the the oil and gas companies also now starting to diversify and starting to acknowledge alternative fuel sources. Um, and we see their investments in, whether it be energy storage companies, um, whether it be in hydrogen fuel cell companies, um, we see the typical ice engines or you know, internal combustion engine companies uh, shifting their investments. So I think that's a, a big indicator that they're acknowledging that this is gonna be the trend, this is gonna be the future of these, of these big companies. Um, and that's really what these small companies need is the influx of, of cash to get through this period of development. Um, to get these first vessels built, to get because it's such a long process, we know in the maritime industry, from from concept to to um, operation, uh, it takes time and it takes that investment. So I think that's going to be one of the one of the important drivers is seeing big companies and companies like ABB um, developing and working in these in these new technology aspects, um, and say diversifying from the traditional oil and gas and internal combustion uh, solutions. Elizabeth. Yes. So when I think about sort of how shipping has been moving over the last um, decade or so, I think, you know, in 2010, 2011, we were really looking at options to implement on our ships to help them um, be more energy efficient in terms of, you know, shaving 5, 10, 15 percent off the, you know, total energy savings that these ships could have. But it's no longer about that. We're talking about getting to zero, having ships operate completely off zero emissions. And in order to do that, ships need to have a new fuel source, alternative fuels, future fuels, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's something the projects I was responsible for were more about optimizing the ships. And now we're looking at how to make them run completely emissions free. And that requires ships to have the infrastructure to and supply and scale of fuel to help them operate in that way. And I think that really falls on the back of regulatory bodies and specific, specifically government to help all industries get there because you know there's a good chance if my ship is fueling in Vancouver Harbor, there's also you know land-based transportation that can be using that same fuel source. So I think as we're moving forward here, the change will come from government um, helping support the energy providers and others who are you know building the infrastructure, doing this type of work, whether they're supporting them you know with additional resources, um, subsidies, usually financing monetary is the best way to support them because they generally know what they're doing and where they want to go. I think that will really be a big driver to helping ships get where they need to go as we move forward here. 
And Andy. I think, yeah, I was going to say, I think building on that, and I'm going to come back to Elizabeth's uh, first points, I think, around collaboration. That there's no single organization in the world that is going to solve this 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 problem. So I think that that whole concept of collaboration is critical. I think things like the Global Maritime Forum, you know, and, and those sorts of initiatives, and you, you mentioned Poseidon Principle, Sea Cargo Charter, et cetera, that's coming out of, you know, sort of, uh, let's say, forums like the Global Maritime Forum is driving that level of transparency and understanding of the problem that we have and the quantum of the problem that we have so that we can look at benchmarking across the industry. And I think once we've got that, then it's the responsibility of the larger organizations, I'm going to say like the ABBs, like the Lloyd's registers and the such like to break those large problems, complex problems into much smaller manageable, I'm going to say chunks that need to be solved. One of the sort of things that we're, we're trying to break down at the moment is that whole concept around marine solutions readiness levels is a combination of technology investment and community and then breaking those further down in terms of the readiness levels associated with technology. So if we look at you know, ammonia, we look at hydrogen, you know, et cetera, and we could have engines that would be available to run on those by 2023, 24, let's say, but the investment readiness level wouldn't be ready because the land infrastructure to support that, the port resilience isn't there but the community accepts it. We then take sort of, you know, I'm gonna say, you know, uh, hydrogen fuel cells through that same debate, the technology's at a lower readiness level, but there is an infrastructure that could support fuel cells and the community accepts it. We run nuclear through the same debate and maybe technically and investment wise, it's actually ready, but the community doesn't want it. So I think that's, that's what we're trying to break down into those sort of, I'm gonna say manageable chunks of readiness levels so that we can then go out to the industry to solve some of those challenges that are maybe more manageable and palatable that will take us on that journey as a transition towards transformation. And, and that's a really interesting uh, part of this as well, because of course, uh, a lot of the more radical innovation and solutions that we need, they won't necessarily come from the corporates. They may come from the outside and from smaller startups, younger innovators. Uh, and at the same time, there are some big frameworks that needs to also be pushed and renewed, which isn't so easy for the small and new actors to, to tackle. So um, can you brainstorm with me a little bit about, you know, where, where are the key areas where you see uh, good opportunities and needs for an increased collaboration between the big corporates and the startups? Um, and and uh, um, which areas, which are the most compelling areas in our industry that uh, a startup could help solve? Um, I will leave that. I will let you continue then uh, a little bit and then back to Elizabeth and Ed. Sure. I, th I, look, I think there's a huge number. And I, th I think that's the point. As we break down some of those readiness levels, what we're doing is setting challenges, let's say, that we can't solve as the, uh, the, the I'm going to say, the larger sort of, you know, organizations. And those are the challenges where we need, you know, to Ed's point, I think some of that fresh thinking that, you know, doesn't necessarily have the... Um, the salty sea dog sort of reputation of the last sort of you know 40 years in in the industry and is bringing you know perspective from outside the industry but also the fresh thinking i mean you know some very clear things you know coming back to elizabeth's point around efficiency you know and really taking a step backwards and ignoring the stakeholders of maritime and looking at shipping efficiency you know, if, if we look at transportation today, we look at charter party contracts, we look at how ships actually sort of get through the Panama Canal, you know, there's a huge amount of inefficiency that we could probably unlock 15, 20% of the efficiency of the industry by, by actually sort of planning better in what we do. And I think that takes an external perspective. In terms of some of the very specifics around technology, you know, again, there's a large number. If, if, if we look at LNG as a transition fuel, we've got to answer the question around methane slip. You know, I think the engine companies are trying to do that, but it's basically a case of it, it's not been answered to date. And, you know, those are the sorts of challenges that we've got in each of the transition pathways for any fuel, um, you know, whether it's alternative or whether it's an existing fuel that we're going to be looking at, you know, the safe application of ammonia and hydrogen within a port environment when you've got a city next door to it. So, I'm, you know, you go into the port of Athens and suddenly we've got, you know, a hydrogen generation center there or we've got an ammonia generation center there. I, th I think there's challenges that will come with that as we look at the, the infrastructure. So I think the 
the whole concept around the technology when we break that down into the the, the manageable elements that we we really need to work on to transition as an industry the challenges become much much clearer and much more granular in terms of some of the problems that we can't solve today and of course we also we are also really in need of breaking some established truths like for instance do we need to fuel our ships in the port yeah. or can we fuel the ships uh, on floating renewable floating energy. power plants yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean yeah yeah uh, there are there's really an ocean of opportunities out here but but we really need to break these silos between our existing our existing mindsets yeah. our common practice and of course the actual um yeah uh, the, the kind of the siloed thinking that we are generally becoming a part of after working in the industry for a few years. Elizabeth, uh, I mean, this is straight up your rally uh, on, on the renewable and uh, emission reduction part. Yeah, well, just hearing Andrew talk there, yeah, I added a few more talking points to what I was going to say. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the biggest challenge the shipping industry faces is we have, you know, two types of ships. We have ships that operate um, what we call like the domestic captive fleet within Canada, they call Canada home. And then we have international deep sea shipping, right? And those ships are more transient ships coming in out. So we're looking at how to address these two different issues. How do we you know, get smaller ship owners or local ship owners, domestic ship owners, these technologies? How do we get international ship owners to adopt these technologies as well? And when I'm you know, talking with ship owners about their different level and ability to access or their capital purchasing power to purchase and implement these technologies, we might see someone who owns you know, like one or two tugboats and he's looking at very different solutions than like I described, you know, the ship owner I work for who owns 112 ships, they're looking at different solutions. So I think Think we'll see you know um, they aren't directly in competitive competition with one another it's very different we'll see you know some ship owners looking to merely cap their emissions they don't want to go completely to zero emissions they just want ways to run as efficiently as possible we'll see other ship owners wanting to go completely to zero emissions and so I think in the mind of many ship owners right now they're thinking first how do I do this how do I take small bites and steps to get there what are the solutions how do I make them practical and one of the biggest challenges the maritime industry faces, which you mentioned here just now, is that, you know, like the shipping industry is like an old dinosaur. It takes them absolutely forever just to roll over. You know, it's just impossible to get them to do so. And we need, you know, more of like a tech industry mindset. We need outsiders. We need more, a larger cross section of younger people, you know, with more of a fire underneath them to come up with ideas that help us to think outside the box. But when, you know, I'm in our offices meeting with young startups and tech companies and they're pitching their ideas to us, they have absolutely great ideas and I would recommend to them I would say if you can try and get a partnership with one of these ship owners go in there not just trying to sell your project product but say hey we want to have a partnership to run a trial a demo you know we want to build that to make it practical and hands-on and once you do that it can easily you, you know you have your demo project it starts to produce results and it can be scalable so that's part of what we're trying to do at vmcc through our what we call our vemer program we get to be branded we our vancouver maritime emissions reduction program we want to pair the end user the operator with technology providers so those who can provide the solution so if anybody is listening and wants to check out on our website afterwards you're more than welcome to give us an email we'll be getting that project up and running shortly because we believe that those pairings are invaluable to addressing you know this issue that we're facing basically the energy transition because i think also in the mind of ship owners when we look we're we're acknowledging that the technology we need to solve these problems may not necessarily exist yet and andrew had talked about how lng is a transition fuel and we view it that way but we're also looking at alternative sources of fuel or others there can be a big blank there a void where you know five ten years something may occur that may either solve all our problems for us or not because shipping is very variable we have you know container ships tugboats pilot boats fishing boats all different sorts of vessels that are going to need all different sorts of solutions to solve the operational challenges that they're facing so i really think this is a great time um, for those from outside the maritime industry to find connections in the maritime industry to help them solve their problems 
And it's interesting because, Ed, I mean, uh, Tesla didn't come from, and Elon Musk didn't come from the automation industry. Uh, we also know that the, the whole principle of container shipping didn't come from a shipping employee either. It was from a yep. port employee. Uh, yep. and, and now we are facing this kind of, this huge transitional shift where, which is, I think, uh, as huge as when we shifted from sail to steam and then from steam to today's engines. And now we're moving toward the next generation of propulsion, but it will be much more um, diverse, really, yeah. and much more hybrid. Yeah. Uh, it's more difficult in some way to find like one optimal super solution that fits for everyone and yet at the same time we know that if we are now as as elizabeth pointed it if we are now focusing on just doing the small small changes and improvements we will never get to the future and we will actually be outraced and we all know what happened to the ship owners that had the sailing ships and who didn't invest in steam and also the the steamship owners who didn't convert uh to the next generation of, of diesel engines so i mean this is really we are in the middle of such a huge transition here. And Absolutely. Course, maybe you guys are uh, perfectly positioned working with uh, a range of these alternative solutions. And yeah, uh, what would you say, uh, looking at this opportunity scope for, for big corporates and, and startup innovators collaboration? Because I also think definitely like Elizabeth definitely. pointed to, uh, that power couples is really the way to go to take the best from both worlds. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And I, I mean, just my advice to, to people who, who want to work with a big corporation, um, what you have to do is, is, is identify the, the weaknesses of the big corporation, which they acknowledge within their own, the bureaucracies, the, the slow decision making, the, the hierarchical uh, ability to get anything done. And if you bring that entrepreneurial and that kind of quick, quick pivoting, um, you know, high value, low cost input into a big company, You'll, you'll, you'll find advocates. And the key is also to find those advocates. They're typically, and I'll speak for the companies I've, I've worked for, um, are usually not in the investment arm of the company. And that's usually where you're steered to. If you say, hey, I'm trying to get an investment or I'm trying to work with, and you go to uh, a, a financial person in Switzerland who, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not really, you need to find advocates, you know, within that company. So the best is if you're going to the trade shows or you're going to their websites and you're finding people who are writing the white papers of interest to, to that are overlapping with your company's um, desires, get contact with those people. And you're not too sure who's going to drive your initiative into a big company. So plant as many seeds as possible. You have to spend more time, probably, you know, just penetrating a company, identifying a company that has a has an overlapping um, desire, and and really try multiple techniques, multiple places. Um, but yeah, usually that investment side of the business is is typically uh, very conservative, and they're just looking at ROI. Um, they're usually not driven by a passion. So so you want to find people with those overlapping passions. Um, as far as as far as you know, how to penetrate and become a, a partner, and then. Yeah, like I said, is, is highlight those those advantages that small companies bring big companies, and and it's definitely a beneficial, a mutually beneficial uh, group. And when you're in part of a big company, you always look at the small companies. We had conversations today about a small company saying, "Oh, how can we compete? They're so agile. They're so low cost to the market. They're so like these are the benefits that that." And then they're probably looking at us going, how can we compete? They have so much resources and they have so much uh, overheads and you know operations. You know, like it's, it's so, so be honest about, um, about the advantages and be honest about the disadvantages of, of a company that you can, you can compensate for, um, I would say, and then find advocates and, and it's really find people with a passion, P people or, or employed at the company that have that common passion and they will become advocates within the company to, to, to help to bring you in um, and then to support you in the different levels of, of uh, partnership, you know, because you need those people within the company who are driving it through, especially on the big company side, because it's so easy for all these initiatives to get started, uh, especially if they're top down, and then they just kind of fizzle out uh, because nobody within the team is really kind of driving it. So, so that would be my my recommendation. And and one really efficient way of also building these kind of quality connections with 
those type of people is actually inviting them in as an advisor into your startup, for instance. Great point. Where they yep. can actually get to know you over time and, yep. and see what you stand for, which values and how you work. But um, when we look at uh, and, and advice and tips, I mean, one thing is like how to get in with the big guys, but, but seen from all of your perspectives, um, I mean, the key take here is really to look at unresolved problems that the industry hasn't been able to deal with and tackle yet. And, and if you, if each of you should pick like three favorite problems that, uh, that you see now, unresolved mm -hmm. issues and bottlenecks that are really ripe for startups to explore and develop solutions for, what would be your, uh, your top three? I can give you my top one and then I'll start and I'll think some more about it, but I think it, it's government funding. Um, I think that's one of the biggest issues and we're working say with the US federal government where educating them that if they have a budget of say $100 million, it's best not spent by giving a uh, hundred companies a million dollars to just change your engines out. And you're going from tier two to tier three engines and now the boat's gonna last another 30 years with, with tier three engines. And then it may be even what the industry is asking for because the owners like that. But instead it's better funded to build a new vessel to say, do some big investments. So I ask everybody to, you know, work with their, work, that's the majority of the funding for green technology. It's coming from some type of taxpayer to, to really ex explain to the people who are, who are administering the funds really how to move the industry forward. And it may not be the way they've been doing in the past. Plus with those funds typically come um, small business, disenfranchised business requirements, um, all sorts of, of areas which will then help these startups um, to get into a project that's, that's forward thinking and it's something that's repeatable. And it's very frustrating when I look at most government owned vessels are usually some of the least um, technological vessels outside of the Navy maybe, but they're still some of the most polluting vessels. But, but if we go to the vessels that are owned and operated by the municipalities, um, it's the largest fleet owners in the United States and Canada is the governments, um, whether they be local municipalities or be the, the federal governments. Um, we really need to collectively push on them to spend the money correctly and for startups to go after those because they, they're set up by law to, to get advantages. And, um, and that's an also a great area to also work with big companies because they can bring an advantage a big company doesn't have where they qualify for, for certain funding um, and then partnering with a big company to help that startup maybe be the face of the, of the contract, but then have the big company be the, the financing backing um, and, and kind of that, you know, insurance to, to make sure it goes smoothly. Because as the other thing with the, the startups is obviously the risk on, on new technologies. So that's my, my two cents is to go after government projects and push them to be um, pushing the new technology and not just retrofitting engines as, as the bulk of their money being spent. So it's more looking at the kind of um, pioneering cluster approach. Yes. And wouldn't it be cool if, if Biden now uh, did the same thing that he announced now on governmental cars? He wanted to now um, renew the entire fleet of governmental cars into EVs. That would be awesome if he decided to do the same for uh, governmental ships. Yeah. Um, Andy, what would be your top three? Or would you choose I one? No, no. I think I'm going to sort of, uh, sort of take take the easy route like Ed there. Just, just, just the one. Um, no, no. So what I was going to say, I think, is um, to me, it's around and, and very similar. I think to Ed is around that there are too many initiatives going on globally at the moment. So we have to see. Um, I'm going to say uh, more collaboration around the problems that we're trying to solve around i'm going to say you know some of the global issues i'm picking up on elizabeth's point and then you can have the local initiatives around some of the local issues that are there to try and solve those and then i'm going to come back to i think the challenge that i think we've we've got to get to is that there is no silver bullet and it's working on the transition paths so we're not looking for the silver bullet that's going to answer all the industry problems, which is, I think, what a lot of people have been set as a challenge. It's really breaking that down into, as I say, some very tangible challenges that we have to make the first steps uh, and make it tangible. Uh, and that's why I'm going to come back to transition fuels and de-risking some future fuels and getting the sort of, I'm going to say, the infrastructure 
in place so that maritime moves at the same pace as the energy production to energy consumption and that to me again into ed's point comes back to to government funding and a coordinated global approach for maritime because maritime on deep sea shipping is a global industry that needs global um let's say uh coordination to make sure that we're solving those global challenges melissa beth so hearing my other uh, um, speakers talk definitely gave me time to think of three. Um, I'm always thinking very practical and results driven. And one of my passions um, has always been underwater hull biofouling management. Um, so other than, you know, doing these changes to your main engine or your propeller, your bulbous bow, which are operational changes, which can produce, you know, five, 10, 15% emissions reduction. You think about if you take a piece of carpet and you drag it through the water versus taking a piece of glass and dragging it through the water, I'm sure everybody can just think of that pole on their hands, the force that you would feel the difference. So if you've got a ship cruising around the ocean that's covered with, you know, algae like grass can be up to 20, 30% extra added resistance. And that means added force that the ship experiences as it's moving forward through the water on that ship's hull, which is a huge amount of fuel consumption. So there is sort of an option in between these smaller things versus alternative fuels, where we can do a lot for ships um, in order to keep their fuel consumption and emissions down. There are a lot of underwater hull cleaning solutions. And as we move forward into the future of underwater hull cleaning, it's, you know, automated uh, machinery that's held on by magnets or, you know, a hydrodynamic force suction onto the hull. Um, but one challenge is that these units that are not driven by a human being cannot access niche areas. So areas of high curvature under the surface of the hull, inside uh, bow thruster tunnels and around the propeller. And of course, this is a challenge that has yet to be solved and is very important for ship owners is how to access and address these areas to, of course, keep that distance down, but also to prevent the contamination of invasive species to different parts of around the world. So this is very important. Um, another area to address would be deep sea ship owners, international ship owners. So I, sorry, I'm getting a bit of feedback here. On this. I'll just give it a second there. Yeah. Um, so deep sea ship owners. So they're very different in how they operate compared to local or domestic ship owners. Um, if, you know, the government of Canada decides to put some new regulations into place, local ship owners have to, you know, comply and follow those regulations. Sea ship owners or transient ships do not. Um, they can do whatever they want. Um, or sorry, not do whatever they want, but just continue on. They're not really under the same regulation. So I think if innovators are thinking of ways that they can affect change in their country or their regional jurisdiction, show that they have some product or technology that works and that is translatable for and appealing for deep sea ship owners, um, then that would very much be a good way forward. Yeah. I think those are great points because they're very specific. Sorry, I was going to jump in because I think because there was a question that came in, I think, as well, Elizabeth, I was just watching it around. I'm going to say some of the other environmental impacts that are also causing issues associated yeah. with, um, let's say, and some of the inefficiency of shipping and underwater noise is another one of those where yeah. we look at, you know, propeller designs, you know, route optimization, et cetera, that builds on what you're saying. And that's a challenge we have as an industry is to look at underwater noise as well yeah. as, I'm going to say, decarbonization of shipping, let's say, in terms of future fuels. Yeah, Sorry, actually, and that, that's okay. That I'm glad you jumped in there because it gave me time to think of my third point, which <laughs> I kind of forgot that I should have written it down. But is I think, you know, people outside the maritime industry can think of completely abstract and new ways to address the challenges we're facing. Like right now we have these huge container ships carrying 13, 14, 20,000 TEUs. That's the 20 foot equivalent unit of containers around the world. Imagine a way to deconstruct that. Like there are, you know, drones that go around the bottom of the ocean, cruising on ocean currents, you know, sim simply by sucking water in and pushing it out um, and can travel around the world emissions free. Imagine if we had underwater highways where containers were going this way. You know, what a great idea. Um, or, you know, like another solution might be um, for uh, 
the underwater cleaning of ships? What if we had ships coming into harbors as if they were locks and they were filled with, you know, fish or some sort of marine life that was eating the algae off the bottom of the ships? There's got to be some solution that our industry and those sort of associated with haven't thought of yet. And these solutions also need to take into account the life cycle of the technology itself, because we did have, you know, the 2020 sulfur cap. And now we have the scrubbers that have come into place and, you know, scrubbers can be open loop or closed loop. If they're open loop, they, you know, wash the exhaust, they collect the sulfur toxic water, and then they can discharge it into the ocean. Of course, the industry is clamping down on it now Well, they will capture it and then they will do what with it, put it on land and what will happen to it. It will go into a holding tank or someone will reuse it or can we use it for something else? It can be the same thing with the cleaning of the underwater hulls of ships. We capture the debris that's being cleaned off the algae, the barnacles, but what do we do with it? We put it in a landfill or can we make it into pellets which can then be burned in an engine? I think innovators can help us address this life cycle issue. It's not just enough for us to use something and then create waste. We need to be thinking about the whole life cycle of what we're doing here in terms of the technology. And you know, I think that will actually be human beings or mankind's best way to interact with the environment in the world going forward is to think about the whole life cycle of what we're doing rather than a case by case basis. So yeah, so maybe that's four areas that we can address, but I think there's a lot of challenges to unpack here, you know, maybe because I am sort of a younger person in the industry and I have can kind of look and say, hey, why aren't we doing this, right? Like this, these are areas we need to address, but I think there's a lot for um, innovators to um, access, you know, have access to in the shipping industry to sort of help out. So, yeah. And I think this is such an interesting area because what you're really touching into here is circular models and yes. regenerative models. Yes. And I mean, yeah. Yeah. if we if we removed ourselves now alongside young ocean entrepreneurs and innovators, and then we said that we should have, you know, emission-free and waste-free industries that are built on circular models that are regenerating resources, not tapping and drawing from resources, but actually yeah. regenerating more resources into the ecosystem than we take out. That's yeah. really a compelling case for the young generation of climate activists, I think, to move yeah. them from climate activists into business activists and really to connect the innovators and the entrepreneurs with the established corporates, because also it's, it's a whole different dynamic and a whole different mindset when you start thinking about circular models rather than this kind of uh, cradle to grave uh, mindset that we are used to in our yeah. industry. And I if think we're so. yeah. upcycling, upcycling instead of recycling, for instance, mm -hmm. that's a huge opportunity to scope, whether it's about ships or rigs or any big installations. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Any, any other ideas that you guys came, uh, came to add now, Ed and Andy, uh, based on Elizabeth's uh, very I think Elizabeth's inputs there were fantastic. And I, th I think it does sort of recognize that ocean economy as opposed to, I'm going to say, the ship as an asset and, and looking at that sort of, I'm going to say, uh, as you say, circular sort of uh, life of this. Bre breaking that down, though, again, I'm going to say into, you know, the bits that people can look at coatings, you know, is another area that we need to look at in terms of whole fouling and the such like coatings in, in maritime are not designed for, you know, the life of the ship, for example, because they're potentially too expensive if we go down those sorts of routes. You know, what is the next Fletner rotor? What is the next air lubrication? And the whole concept is how do you reduce the existing power plant that is burning hydrocarbons? with the emissions that that has with it. So whether that's carbon capture or whether it's reduction in the use of the power plant with alternative technology and whether that be wind, wave, solar, tidal, whatever can be used as an alternative energy source to reduce the consumption within the existing power plant on the existing ships within the water it is a clear challenge that uh, is being laid down by IMO as far as potential regulation is coming with EEXI. So any solutions around those sorts of aspects of reducing the use of the existing power plant are critical and hull fouling, underwater noise, cavitation, uh, you know, all the issues that come up um for contributors to inefficient fuel use is is key to some of the tech capabilities and let's say inputs that are really required by the industry uh, to solve to reduce as i say the the, the fuel consumption today hmm. i think now we have 
uh, quite a few questions from the audience. Uh, and we will later break out into uh, breakout, breakout rooms uh, for those that are able to attend. And I think that would be really uh, worthwhile. Uh, so let's see here. Um, um, Mark from Lockstep asks, um, he says that we incentivize good supply chain behavior by providing cheap capital for suppliers to make sustainable transportation decisions. But how do we incentivize vessel operators to provide accurate fuel consumption information so that all the carbon accounting work that's going on isn't for naught? I, I, I can probably jump in. I, I don't know. So I think that's what's being driven in terms of the data transparency at the moment that's being driven down through... I'm going to say uh, sort of additional stakeholders within the industry. So whether that's the financiers, the insurers or the charterers now are asking for that accuracy of fuel consumption uh, and whether that be through existing MRV uh, or DCS data. So the, you know, I'm going to say the annual emissions reports that have to be submitted to, to IMO or the, uh, or the EU. Um, but also what we're now seeing is noon reports. So we're now seeing that being asked for effectively on a daily basis, which is effectively what the sea cargo charter will, will, will dictate. So I think what I would say is that level of transparency will be going up um, you know, across the industry. And it's being driven from uh, the Global Maritime Forum. Uh, and it's being driven from, uh, as I say, the, the financiers who are looking at their you know, sort of portfolios, the charterers looking at their portfolios in terms of ESG reporting. Um, and I'm going to say sustainable and sort of uh, conscientious, let's say, shipping in terms of the benchmarking that will come out from that. And that's obviously uh, an area that is perfect for tech savvy entrepreneurs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's a very manual process today. So I think that that's the answer at the moment. It's, it, it some is. of these noon reports are handwritten uh, still today, candidly. Um, so mm -hmm. even if we were to have HTML sort of, you know, or even Excel, let's say, it would be a major step forward in the industry from handwritten noon reports today to, to I'm going to say, automated uh, noon reports back into CMMS systems. So some of the computerized systems on board that would automatically produce those reports. It's a real tech, uh, let's say, challenge that we currently have. Mm. And then we have uh, Jackie from Ocean Sonics asking about the practice on this this area that we just briefly touched upon before with um, best practice on ship underwater noise management. And I mean, whereas um, uh, distribution and open data when it comes to emissions uh, is one thing, then we also know that um, tracking and, and measuring the uh, impact of noise and also looking at the quality uh, of the water and various parameters where we would need sensors and a whole different range of technologies in place. Uh, that's also an area where there are many opportunities moving forward. Um, Ed, would that be something that you have uh, some insights in? As you were so, yeah, it's something I, and I think uh, in, in Vancouver and Elizabeth's uh, backyard is probably the the uh, best underwater analysis is being done because of concern for the uh, for the whales, for the mammals in the area. Um, there's a lot of testing, a lot of importance being put on that um, by the um, BC ferries and, and all the transient ships through through Vancouver. Um, so it is definitely when we look at sustainable shipping, it's it's the air emissions, it's the water pollution, and then the, the noise um, is certainly a key element to that. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a combination. Um, obviously, with frequency, it's an issue of frequency. So there's different frequencies. Noise is, is consists of different frequencies. And different frequencies have different impacts on the environment. Um, and it's really kind of now where I think in the past, we, we, we haven't really been looking at that. Now there's a lot of attention being put to it, figuring out which are the disruptive frequencies. I know with just the, the whale population, there's a, there's a hunting frequency. And then there's a annoyance frequency. Um, where you know one is upsetting their communication and one of them is just bothering them and forcing them to migrate from an area. So, so both are disruptive, but two different frequencies. So as we're, we're learning about that, then we're able to measure on propulsion, on propeller design, uh, on electric motor driven versus uh, gearbox driven noise. Um, so there's, it's, it's definitely an emerging field. Um, like I said, I think um, Canada and, and Vancouver area is leading in this technology, some great companies. Um, that are out there, they're, they're pulling sonar arrays, they're listening. So it's a lot of it's coming from the former military 
uh, type of, of signature uh, of, you know, of, of Cold War vessel signature. Uh, technology is now being utilized in, in a positive way for, for finding improvements to the environment. Um, great opportunities. I think it's going to be um, one of the key drivers globally in the future. Um, right now, it's probably more on that short distance or certain ports are, are aware of it that, that have a sensitivity to it. But, uh, but I think it's going to become uh, more and more important as time goes by. Yeah. Well, thank you. And then let's see, um, Eric posted a question here uh, quite early on. Um, um, he's read that the 16 largest tankers produce more pollution than the world's 750 million cars. What is the low hanging fruit that innovators can grasp at to try to really reduce pollution from the largest ships? And then of course, now we have been touching into the, um, the biofouling issue. Are there, that's one very clear area. Um, what else would you uh, recommend people to look into? It, you're looking at me here to answer that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I would keep in mind um, to Eric that shipping is still the most energy efficient way to transport goods in the world. So it is more energy efficient than cars, than rail, than any other way that you can uh, transport goods around the world. So even though, what was the figure? 7 million cars there, something like 50 million cars. Yeah. It's so that, one. yeah, cars, you know, are very small. So that this number can be quite large there compared to one tanker ship, but there are only so many ways that we can address, you know, how to optimize ships. One of them will be hydrodynamic changes to the vessel. So tankers will have an optimized bulbous bow, propeller, any energy saving devices added to them. Their hull form will also be you know, designed in a hydrodynamic way, meaning that the water is flowing nicely and smoothly around the vessel. They will be operated at speeds that allow for smooth water flow around the ship. They can also be optimized in terms of their engine performance. So prior to the market crash of 2009, um, ships were designed at a top speed. So say, you know, you can think of these large ships going 23, 24 knots was their design speed quite quickly through the water. But then afterwards, um, with the prices of oil, now ship owners wanted to do slow steaming, but you had ships that were designed to go at very high speeds, going at lower speeds, meaning that they were going at low speeds and consuming less fuel, but they were doing so in a more energy inefficient way. So it's like if you had a vehicle, you can purchase a vehicle that is optimized for city driving or highway driving. Now, often if you own an electrical vehicle, you can switch between those modes, or sorry, not an electric ve electrical vehicle, but you can switch between some uh, vehicles uh, in those modes modes. Um, now ships post to that 2009 market are now being designed to look at their operating profile. So where are they spending 80, 90% of their time at 15, 16 knots? Now we're designing the ships and optimizing the engine to go at those speeds. So that would be another way that ship owners can do to address that. There's also ways in terms of reusing the exhaust gas, um, turbocharger cutouts, other things that can be implemented on the ships. Um, Andrew had mentioned coatings. So I don't know if he was thinking of um, coatings going on the top sides as well for rust prevention, but I'm assuming you meant the underwater hull surface paint. Um, in 2007, the use of tin was banned in these paints, um, which left a huge gap open in the market for coating providers to provide or come up with new solutions and ways to prevent biofouling from forming on the bottom of vessels. They still don't have a hundred percent good solution, um, which is why, as Andrew mentioned, there's alternatives like air lubrication or other technologies that we can apply on the bottom of ships to prevent this growth of biofouling management. So there's many ways that ship owners can address and they are all actively, many of them doing this. Um, the larger ones, um, container ship owners like you know Maris, the company I work for, CSAN, Hapig, Lloyd, there's many others who are been doing this for many years and will continue to do so. And as they continue to push the boundaries and move forward, it will drag along the smaller ship owners who will do so as well. Um, so I just want to reassure Eric that 700 million cars sounds like a lot, but ship <laughs> owners are doing all they can. And there's people in the industry like myself and others who our jobs are primarily dedicated to this and we're doing all we can to get there and make sure that we do reach zero emissions. And we're going to uh, wrap up with uh, the Tesla company question, but I, I would first actually like to, to add one of my uh, clear uh, big wishes for the next years to come, because I, I, had the, uh, I had the pleasure of challenging the top CEO of Jotun, 
the world's biggest paint provider about this. I asked him on, um, backstage uh, some months ago, when are they going to take a lead position on producing uh, plastic and, and, uh, uh, and toxic free paint for our house? Uh, because I think this would really be an amazing opportunity for startups. And, and he wasn't interested in even discussing it on stage. It was removed from the uh, manuscript. So I think that is really, it's, it's a huge problem that we have because we pollute also. One thing is on the, on the hull when, uh, when you have the biofouling, but you also have an enormous impact when it comes to microplastic and, and toxic waste coming into the oceans from our hulls. I would completely uh, agree with that. I didn't want to kind of get into more of that because yeah. I'm trying to keep my answers concise, but this is a huge concern of mine. You know, we talked about sort of the life cycle planning of this as well. It's like, you know, we're addressing one solution by putting a Band-Aid on it, creating more chemicals, more waste is not an acceptable solution. There needs to be a better way to address this problem. Yeah, for sure. And I'd fully build on that. I think, uh, Elizabeth, in terms of solving some of the challenges, because we could use, for example, methanol again today as a fuel, but we haven't answered the e-methanol debate. So I think that that's the point about making sure that we're making the right steps. And that's why I mentioned coatings, because there are potential solutions that would be a Band-Aid uh, to Elizabeth's yeah. point, but I think they're not the right solution. So I think taking a step backwards and setting some of those challenges to you know tech startups and others from outside the industry, I think is exactly what we should be doing. Because to Elizabeth's point, again, I think we, we could make the wrong decision in the short term. Yeah. And my industry involvement, I'm quite involved with NACE um, and standard yep. writing and they're, you know, supporting the IMO and a lot of those guys were working with the IMO to come up with the decision to ban the tin. And they did not foresee the downstream effects that this would have on an injection of other possibly more harmful chemicals and contaminants into the ocean system, because now they couldn't use tin. So what were they going to use copper or other biocides in the paint? So it's something that we are talking about constantly and how do we um, not have these very harsh, you know, downstream effects from the decisions that we're making on one end of the spectrum. So, yeah. Okay, I will leave it there for now. We'll round off our discussion now and hand the word back to Donald. And I think we can look forward to very engaged discussions in the, the breakout room. So thank you from my end in Oslo. It's been great. Well, thank you. This was an amazing conversation. I love hearing uh, large organizations like an ABB and a Lloyd's talking about the need for startups to come up with the innovative ideas that, uh, that some of these bigger organizations just don't have time to think about or aren't thinking about. So hugely, hugely important to what we're trying to foster here in Canada with the Ocean Startup Project. So an incredible conversation. And that last conversation where Elizabeth was talking about coatings and Andy was talking about coatings, one of the great parts of that is we do have a startup in our cohort right now working on that Kavacha. So uh, really, really exciting nexus there for us. So check them out for sure. Um, so before we go to the breakout rooms, I just a huge thank you to you, you Birgit, uh, for being our moderator today. That was just a terrific, terrific discussion. And thank you to Ed and Andy and Elizabeth. Such a, such a, a a strong panel and so much great information coming across for, for our uh, listeners. Uh, the, the comments in the chat have just been terrific and, and I'm getting a lot of private messages as well, just saying how much people are enjoying this conversation. So I think they want it to go for four more hours, but we all have other things we have to do. And Birgit, you probably have to get to bed and Andy, you probably have <laughs> to get to bed. So really, really just a, a, a big thank you for taking your time to do this because it means a lot to, to us here at the Ocean Startup Project and to, to Canadians generally and, and people around the world who are listening into this. So uh, great stuff. As well, I just want to say a thank you to Natasha Legay, Katie Leard, Shelley Hessian, Eric Siegel, and to Charlotte at the Ocean Opportunity Lab uh, who have just been outstanding to make this happen. 